Uh, and I, we thought we would kick it off uh, with a few questions for Lana about tracing the trajectory of the book, where it comes from and how her thinking has evolved. Um, so that's all right. Should we get started, Lana? Sure, yeah. I mean, the other thing, just by way of introduction, um, I wanted to say was, um, you know, when Asim and I talked about this, we were initially imagining it just the, as we understood it as kind of a closed um, group conversation with CMS students, um, which I'm totally excited for it to, for our, all kinds of people, uh, who, some of whom I know, some of whom I don't, to be here. Um, but we do because we, you know, we're both alumni of CMS, we do want to make sure that our kind of initial and primary audience are the, the graduate students. So we're going to kind of have that lens in mind. And we want to also um, be sure to answer questions and talk both about the book, but also about the trajectories of both of our careers um, as to CMS folks from two different eras really, um, and different eras from the present uh, who have made academic careers um, and are now in the same department uh, somewhat, you know, quite fortuitously. Um, so yeah, so in addition to the book, I, I do want this to take this opportunity to have a kind of broader conversation. Um, one of the reasons why I asked, you know, asked Quinn to be my interlocutor on this is that, um, you know, we are colleagues now and I'm, really respect his work and I think he will uh will will bring kind of an interesting other flip side to the conversation but also you know when I was a CMS student we got the word that that Aswin had just gotten a tenure track job and he was the first CMS alum as far as we, I knew um to get the tenure track job and as part of our process and selecting um you know working up to the thesis you know we were asked to read um, papers, read prior theses from previous uh, CMS students. And and I one of the ones that I read was Aswin. So I was always, I've been a big fan of Aswin since before he had a tenure track job and since I was a CMS student. So um, I hope we can do some meta stuff here, but not too much, I guess. I think that'll be a lot of fun. And yeah. <laughs> I've already instructed Andrew to delete every possible copy there is of my master's thesis. <laughs> no, it's so good. <laughs> uh, so let's, yeah, let's get going. So I guess one of the two ways in which um, CMS really shaped my thinking, and I'm sure it's the same for you, Lana, is um, A, to think comparatively, which meant quite um, simply to think across media forms, to think across historical moments, and to think across cultural contexts. And the other key sort of phrase that has stayed with me is to think about media always as in transition. Mm -hmm. So with those two things in mind, I thought we could open the conversation by uh, having you reflect a little bit uh, on the conjuncture of, uh, in terms of when you began mm -hmm. thinking about this topic itself as a project you wanted to pursue and sort of have a, uh, a temporal bracket of sorts. So it was around 2007 or eight when you started mm -hmm. actively imagining this as a dissertation project mm -hmm. and eventually a book coming out of the financial crisis um, mm -hmm. that we were plunged into at that moment in the US. And now here we are in 2020 at a very different political mm -hmm. conjuncture, but how which has also some serious financial and political ramifications as well. Mm -hmm. So with these two bookends in mind, could you just start off by telling us a little bit about how that moment um, led to your even beginning to imagine this as a viable long-term project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I absolutely agree and have found that the term media in transition, which I, when I was in CMS, I was sort of like, yeah, yeah, media in transition, it's the name of the books that, you know, Thorburn and Henry wrote, and that's the name of our conference, blah, blah, blah. What does it even mean? Um, but then again and again, it's something I come back to. Um, and and this kind of um, analytical tool that says, okay, let's look at moments of media change. We're not interested so much in new media for the sake of newness. Um, we're interested in moments of you know, disjuncture and, and shifting. And if we really zero in and focus in on those moments of change, you know, what do we learn? Um, and that really is the primary analytic for my um, entire book. Like every, there is one kind of big historical chapter that looks at moments of media change and looks at money as a, a payment or rather looks at money as media and then kind of touches down at key moments of change, but then every other chapter that follows examines the a moment of newness, but also um, all of the 
the things that kind of led up to that moment of newness. So absolutely, I think, and I think we'll likely kind of circle back to that um, as we chat. But to answer your question, and I think this kind of is interesting to think about the kind of historiography of um, transition. So you you mentioned that I started conceiving of this as a dissertation project around 2007, 2008, and that's actually not true. Um, I I started conceiving as a, as a dissertation project probably closer to 2011, 2012. So, you know, I finished CMS in 2009. I had written a thesis on counterfeit luxury goods um, and kind of regimes of ownership and authorship. Uh, and then I started my PhD that following year, 2009, 2010, probably wasn't in the thick of it in until of, of thinking about dissertations for another couple of years. Um, but it's it absolutely the moment that the dissertation is born out of is the 2008, 2000 or 2007, 2008 financial crisis and a variety of other media changes that happened at that moment. And it really is only retrospectively, and this is why I speak of, you know, historiography, that 2008 becomes 2008. So 2008 probably wasn't 2008 until 2010. Um, although maybe 2020 might already be 2020. Um, so thinking about like when we become aware of, of moments as being moments. All that being said, um, I started thinking the, the year 2007, 2008 marks an important moment for thinking about money as a communication technology because of a few you know interrelated um, factors. So we did, as you mentioned, had the 2008 global financial crisis, which I really believe ignited a moment of kind of rethinking money. So suddenly we had broad-based global movements that sort of said, you know, what are the, you know, like why should traditional governments and traditional financial systems um, be the primary producers of money? Um, are there other ways to do the economy? And of course, you know, thinking about Occupy and those sort of things, that wasn't really until 2012, 2013. So like the way history moves is interesting. Um, and so, yeah, so we have this moment where we were kind of collectively rethinking the economy. I always go back to this one Onion article, um, which, you know, sometimes it's, it proves to be true that Onion kind of like speaks the truth, but um, that says, you know, it was a headline that said, um, the US economy or global economy grinds to halt as everyone realizes that money is nothing more than a shared um, delusion. And they, this article describes this like sudden awakening, just like rippling across the populace where suddenly a bank robber is like, why am I robbing a bank? This is so dumb. And uh, someone about to have their house foreclosed upon is like, oh, I don't, I don't have to leave my house. That's awesome. Um, but then, and then they're like, well, cool. Now that we know this, what are we going to do? And there's just a moment of like, oh, wait a minute. Money actually serves like a pretty useful purpose for deciding how to broker goods and services and how to figure out how to communicate um, in a, an economy. And so I kind of think there's this like moment of awakening, but then this moment of, of like, okay, when the rubber hits the road, how are we actually going to think about building new systems that might be um, alternatives to um, the thing that we've suddenly realized maybe we don't want. So that's, that's, there's that, that, that factor. And then also 2007, 2008 was the emergence of the um, iPhone followed quickly thereafter by um, the Android. Um, so, so suddenly we were carrying around in our pocket, you know, these what had previously been like fairly sophisticated computers that do a lot of the things that um, we need to kind of do money with. So um, have some kind of uh, universal address book, um, hat like such as Facebook, um, which f that year is also the year when Facebook kind of has the tipping point of becoming this like truly kind of mass scale um, uh, system. Um, and keep account of records. So, you know, various, you know, if you have an Excel spreadsheet and you have a way of transmitting information and you have a way of contacting someone, you kind of can like do money. And that's that's pretty much all you need um, in many ways. And the whole, and then the hard part is a system for authorizing um, and making that the information kind of socially guaranteed to be valuable. Um, and then of course we have M-Pesa, which was the, um, you know, the first large scale, uh, um, mobile money system. So there had been attempts to do mobile money and mobile payments for a long time. And um, mostly in Kenya, but also in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, we had the, the 
you know, the proof of concept. So um, suddenly, and so I trace that as a moment where a lot of the innovations that kind of became fintech, um, became crypto, became all the things I kind of study in my book um, were kind of born. So by the time I finished the dissertation, which was in 2000, I don't know, 14, <laughs> when did I finish? Yeah, no, 2015, um, you know, I had been able to kind of follow along with the cohort of people who were trying to rethink money from a bunch of different angles who all got interested in it around the same time I did. So it was a fortuitous time to study uh, transition as it happened. Yeah, I mean, th that's a great start. And I think what you've captured is the difficulties involved in mapping a moment as it unfolds. Mm -hmm. But then when you finally get to the end of a dissertation and you turn it into a book, you have that space to then step back and carefully historicize it and mm -hmm. then lead up to that moment, which you do beautifully in the book. And I'm just going to read out a couple of sentences as a way to get deeper into it. So at the very beginning, what I really like is the way you set things up, offer a very clear argument at the beginning. And then you offer this wonderful structure for the whole book. You said, this is a book about the cultural politics of transactional technologies. It offers a new way to think about money as a communication medium dependent on particular technologies. And then you go on to say that each chapter takes up an essential mechanism of payment and explain how, explains how it works, which you do beautifully, how it got to be that way, how it's changing, and what implications those changes may have and for whom, right? Mm -hmm. And I read this and I thought, especially in what you just explained, it could not have been obvious as a PhD student in a media and communication department that you could very quickly and easily situate the question of money and payment within media and communication studies. It's not obvious at all to begin with, right? And you turn to James Carey and some other domains of media theory as a way to then think through a structure, give it a theoretical scaffolding. So could you then take us to that next step, which is once you proposed a dissertation, did your advisor say, that's crazy? And then B, how did you sort of, how did you work your way through different disciplines to then come up with this framework and ground yourself mm -hmm. in media and communication studies instead of going off into cultural anthropology or sociology or so on? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, um, so as I mentioned, I was coming off of a CMS thesis where I was studying um, counterfeit luxury goods, so like fake bags, um, fake Louis Vuitton bags and shoes and that sort of thing. And I was studying the fan communities um, who come together, um, who are really like kind of connoisseurs of the fake, um, mostly entirely online. And they, um, you know, they, these are people who um, use global, you know, really kind of interestingly, like global supply chains. Um, today, they're using things like WeChat and Taobao to like order direct from, um, you know, folks in China who are making like the best fakes. Um, and in many ways, these fakes are like better than the real. And they say things like, because they have like better stitching, they're actually handmade, whereas the real, the reels are no longer actually handmade. Um, and they say things like, you know, anyone can walk into any, anyone with $2,000 can walk into a Louis Vuitton store and buy the real version. Only I, because I have the social network, the technical savvy, and the depth of expertise um, to understand what makes a perfect fake, um, can buy the perfect fake, and I'm part of this community, et cetera. And so I was really interested at that moment in studying kind of marketplaces as a culture and um, kind of the and and the the online communities that are that come up around markets and also the. The oh, and I'm I'm quite familiar with the Reddit uh, group that just got posted. There's a few of those, so I need to do. I would love to do an update to that project um, sooner rather than later, but we'll see. Um, and also, kind of the technologies that people use to kind of do markets. So I was really attuned both through CMS, but also through an interest in kind of SDS, science and technology studies, and infrastructure studies, um, to look not just at um, the way ideas, information, communities circulate, but the actual infrastructures that allow them to circulate. Um, so I, I, I became pretty interested in economic anthropology at that moment and was reading quite broadly in the kind of ideas um, around the culture of, of economic practice, and then was attuned to thinking about, you know, what those infrastructure, like how infrastructure played a role. 
Fortunately, um, I went to the University of Southern California's Annenberg School for my PhD. And fortunately, um, I happened to be co-located just uh, about an hour away from Bill Maurer, who's an economic anthropologist at, at UC Irvine, um, who had been studying payments and was really kind of the, like I, I became really interested in payments and payment systems and the infrastructures of, um, of economic practice. And then just an hour away was the only other person in the world who at that moment was actually interested um, in it. And we met and we were able to just be like, you know, have these long intense sessions where we were just geeking out about the things we knew about the Visa MasterCard network or, um, you know, the intricacies of, of the way various payment infrastructures worked. And at the time, we sort of talked about ourselves as like a field of two. Um, that is no longer true. And that wasn't even true at the time, but it was, you know, the people we knew. Um, so, and then the other thing I really had to do though, um, and Mary's very sweet to, to say, you know, you know, this kind of official pedigree of like, you know, who's an anthropologist, who's not. I did have to say though, you know, I'm not an anthropologist. My training is not going to be primarily in anthropology. My training is going to be primarily in communication. Um, and then, and then the question of like communication versus media studies is another one. Um, but, but nevertheless, I, I, I had to really almost use my training and use the title of my PhD as an oblique strategy um, to think about, you know, what kind of contribution I could make. Um, so, so what I, I, I came to think about was this idea that, you know, money is fundamentally communicative. Um, you know, a transaction is a trans moving action, a movement across, a movement from one account to another. Um, and whether that happened, and then, and then we have to attend to the media or the kind of infrastructures or technologies that, that allow that transaction to take place or, or enable that transaction to take place. And then what, and then ask questions like, what are the politics of those infrastructures? Um, so while Bill and others um, are, uh, are, are thinking about it from, like, you know, at one point, Bill and I were having kind of these conversations and he, he I realized he brought to bear all of this. I, I was always intimidated because he's a very senior scholar, super genius, um, and he knew all this stuff about the anthropological record and I didn't. But then I realized, oh, wait a minute, like he's not thinking about it in this kind of media studies and communication way. And I actually am. And all the ways that I had kind of been taken, taken for granted about my training, um, Worked were a totally new way to kind of think about this. Um, so, so yeah. No, really um, yeah. I mean, especially when you say that one of your goals in this book is to, you know, move beyond the taken for grantedness mm -hmm. that money is something that's symbolic and expressive. Mm -hmm. And it's really fantastic how you take what you just said, the transaction, mm -hmm. and then you work it out in each chapter. And just for those of you who don't have the book yet, um, each chapter works out a different dimension, a different sort of. Um, a different logic of transaction, let's say, uh, with one chapter offering a really wonderful short history. I mean, this is a really a model for how to write a short history. <laughs> and then you go through and say, you know, questions of identity, politics, memories, publics, and then finally futures. Mm -hmm. And what I like is the real nice narrative thread you have with this notion of transaction, uh, and you draw so fruitfully on James Carey, and what you actually managed to pull off, which is brilliant, is to achieve a sort of synthesis between the ritual and the transmission views mm -hmm. of communication mm -hmm. that we all sort of uh, cite endlessly, but never quite bring those two, two things together <laughs> in our own analytic frame, which you do really well. So I guess that leads to the next question. Um, and there are places which I've sort of bookmarked um, in my copy, which I'm gonna to return to every now and then. You talk a little bit about infrastructure, but um, mm -hmm. I wish, uh, I hope we can talk a little bit about the citizenship part mm -hmm. that you really get into. Um, and there's one bit on page 107 where you have this really evocative line about getting paid. Mm -hmm. uh, that the task for those who hope to design how we get paid in the future is to figure out how to maintain all the things that cash and so on. And I was wondering if we can talk, given our current context and mm -hmm. also 2008, 2009, have you also had a chance to reflect on not getting paid mm -hmm. and how that also figures in these kinds of transactional um, transactional spaces that we mm -hmm. all inhabit, uh, given the global financial crisis and given what we're all sort of dealing with now? Yes, and I think that that question really points 
um, helps me point really specifically to what I hope is one of the key interventions of the book, which is we tend to think about the politics of money, the politics of getting paid and not getting paid um, in terms of quantity um, and distribution. So who has money, who has not enough of it, who has too much of it? Um, and these are sort of economic questions. Um, but there are also kind of communicative questions we can ask about the technologies of money that we only really see if we become attuned to thinking about money as media, money as a technology. Um, so I argue in that chapter about getting paid that one of the, um, you know, that, that, that not having access to the money that you have and not being able to use the money that you have is as good as not having any money at all. Um, and so, so, and I use the example of a, um, and I think, you know, this is a case I, I had to write about because I kept coming back to it again and again, but so I'll just kind of briefly tell that story. Um, a story of a woman who named Eden Alexander, who was a cam girl, online sex worker, um, who um, had a medical emergency, you know, very common, a, a very catastrophic reaction to a very common medication um, and found herself um, unable to work essentially. And, you know, she doesn't, didn't have health insurance. This is before the Affordable Care Act. Um, and found herself kind of in pretty dire straits in the kind of American healthcare system. Um, and so what her community did, which is what communities have always done, is they kind of passed the hat to try to raise money um, to defer the costs of, uh, of, of, her, health, of her crisis. Um, and it being, uh, you know, the 20 teens, um, it was done through a crowdfunding campaign. Um, and it, the platform is one that is no longer, no longer exists, um, but was specifically um, geared towards healthcare expenses. And um, so because she was, you know, minor celebrity, had lot, you know, had plenty of Twitter followers, um, she was able to raise money fairly quickly. Um, and one of her friends who is person in her community set off tweeted, um, I will, offer a free pick set, meaning pornography, um, to anyone who donates $100 or more to Eden's campaign. Um, Eden's own Twitter account, there's some question about whether or not Eden was the one who tweeted it because she was in the hospital, it doesn't matter, um, retweeted that. And then suddenly Eden got a ton of messages stating that her, her she had violated the terms of service of the, of the, um, the platform. The uh, and all donations, so, and her, her campaign had been suspended and all donations had been refunded. Um, and then there was again, kind of a, you know, huge backlash. She had enough Twitter followers for it to be the kind of cause of the day. Um, and another crowdfunding campaign stepped in and said, oh, you know, we'll be happy to help you. We'll step in and, and we'll, and that one also no longer exists, but they were trying to kind of make their name off of being the um, helpful platform, the good platform in this kind of uh, moment. Um, but that's not, you know, something most people have the acts, you know, the ability to do. We're not all able to kind of wield an army of Twitter followers to do customer service on our behalf. Um, so uh, when the, you know, people were sort of examining and offering various hot takes um, around what had happened, you know, Eden's supporters somewhat, you know, rightly said, you know, kind of blamed that um, the crowdfunding campaign as being like a group of tech bros who felt like it was their right to um, create, you know, make moral evaluations of who should be able to get money and, and who shouldn't. Um, and then the crowdfunding campaign said, oh, we, well, tried to say like, what actually happened was, when she retweeted the offer for pornography, it became a transaction for pornography rather than a transaction for crowdfunding. So it became this kind of financial moment. And we are required by our underlying payments processor to not accept and allow donation or um, transactions for pornography. That's, you know, part of a thing where like a, a taboo list. Um, and then and then the payments processor, um, WePay, said, oh, actually, we're not the ones prohibiting it. It's our Visa MasterCard network underneath um, us prohibiting it. So it's this kind of passing the buck of who made the rules um, that, that ultimately prohibited um, sex work um, from being transactable on this site. Um, and, and so what I did and what I think was really important and my kind of training um, 
allowed me to be able to do this was to say, okay, what really happened here? Why are the rules the such as that they are? Um, and what I learned is that basically in the kind of old system of uh, payments acquiring, um, mer individual or merchants are able to acquire payments. Um, well, uh, I'll say acquirers, meaning like the banks that serve merchants are able to kind of acquire payments on behalf of merchants according to a particular set of risk logics and risk appetites. And if you are considered a high risk merchant, meaning high risk for chargeback, meaning high risk that the customer that you have is going to say, I want my money back, um, then you will get charged more for your payments. Um, so there seems to be belief, I have not seen any actual evidence, this is actually true, that the selling of pornography of any kind um, produces a higher rate of chargebacks. And the reason for this might be that people say like, oh, it wasn't me that bought that subscription, it was my kid or, um, or you know, sorry, boss or spouse, I didn't make this transaction, et cetera. Or it could be that historically pornography, especially online pornography is pretty scammy. Um, and you might like sign up for, you might think you're doing a one-time payment, but it winds up becoming this recurring payment. Um, but for whatever reason, it is received wisdom in the payments industry that if you want to receive payments for pornography, you have to pay more. Um, but in the platform economy, everything sort of becomes one size fits all. And rather than there being this kind of bespoke risk model on an individual merchant basis that um, you know creates a market for risk um, in the, the payments acquiring system, uh, it becomes this what what becomes like a, a way of pricing variable kinds of transactions becomes a one size fits all prohibition as inscribed in terms of service. Um, there is no real way for uh, pay, for any kind of platform to write a bespoke um, kind of or even variable governance system, it seems. Um, so they just say all the things that used to be a little bit more expensive or a little bit strange or, or a little bit um, outside the norm for the way we do payments are just going to be completely prohibited. Um, so it's this importing wholesale without really considering it um, of, of one risk model into this a, a new kind of risk model that created this misalignment that created what was what could have been a quite catastrophic situation for um, this person, for Eden, um, and indeed is a catastrophic situation um, for countless people who suddenly and without real, um, with without any real ability to predict it, um, suddenly lose access to their payments. Um, so for me, I really have been interested in how like people are not just didn't, denied money, like just don't have, you know, enough money, but rather are denied access to the money that they have. And, and what are the reasons, like actual reasons that that happens for? Um, I mean, another example is like in the United States under using EBT, which is our kind of welfare cards, um, you, you can only use your EBT payment card to buy certain kinds of merchandise. So if you walk into a store, you can't buy a hot chicken. Um, be, even though rotisserie chickens are a loss leader for uh, supermarkets and are really great for, um, you know, some a working person who may have a family they want to feed, you know, such as most people who receive welfare, um, they um, they often, you know, so so you can't buy a hot chicken, but you can buy a hot chicken that has been chilled and placed in a chilled um, refrigerator system um, because that is no longer hot food that becomes cold food and therefore you're able to buy it using your EBT card. Um, so what interests me in kind of thinking about the kind of like social justice questions or political questions of payments is not just, or of money, is not just how you have money or if you have money, but how the money you have works and how the way it works reinscribes um, or produces new kinds of injustices, new kinds of inequalities. Um, and, and thinking about those inequalities as um, questions of access and questions of kind of informational and communicative, um, you know, sticking points. Yeah, you have this really um, evocative line at one point in that chapter where you talk about the profound implications of what you call losing the citizenship mm -hmm. of a transactional community. And 
that line um, really gets to the racialized and gendered sort of dimensions of what you've just laid out so, so wonderfully well. And I was wondering if, given that you started this project in LA and you were going back and forth between Irvine and other spaces and LA itself was a space, this notion of losing the citizenship of a community of transaction of moving across spaces and moving over time. Um, I was wondering if there's a link between migrants, migration, mm. payment systems um, that were part of your thinking at the time, were others uh, perhaps in your community of economic anthropology meets media studies, were others working on it or how have you seen that emerge? Um, and I ask that in part because there's this really amazing piece that you have about memory and you say money is memory. And those three words, money, memory, migration, really come together in very powerful ways for me. And I wanted to ask you to reflect a little bit on those three key words. Yeah, so when I think about money as memory, um, I come at it from a few different perspectives. So I think about, you know, it's, it's interesting that the idea that money is memory is something that occurs across um, uh, many different fields of scholarship who are not at all in communication with each other. So for example, economists, like kind of game theoretic economists talk about money as memory because in, in a kind of game theory context and kind of an economic experiment, um, you, can, you can either have a tally system. So like a, a system of, of keeping accounts that everyone can see a kind of memory system, or you can have a money system, meaning tokens that people exchange. And in a in a economic experiment, um, either way, the whether you have a memory system or a money system, it kind of produces the same outcomes in gameplay. So in that sense, like money is a literal like exo memory, which is a, a term that actually Nancy Bame, uh, I got from Nancy Bame, a science fiction book Nancy Bame wrote, but it's this kind of collective memory or external memory system um, that we use to remember in a, you know, economic sense, um, our transactions, you know, I have, we have transacted, I have paid you, now you have the money, and I don't, and we both remember that that transaction has occurred. Um, but then anthropologists who are not at all in communication with, you know, this particular stream of, of game theory will also write that money is memory. And they mean that, yes, it is this way of keeping track of our interobligations, but they mean that in much more of a, um, a, a kind of a sense of, of kind of socio, the kind of sociocultural dimensions of that. Um, and, and so, you know, Viviana Zelzer and economic sociologists talk about these kind of like spheres of exchange and um, networks. Well, uh, they all, there's like some people, there's like some people say networks, some people say spheres, some people say circuits, et cetera. Um, but the way that um, money kind of traces the tessellations of our interobligations to each other. Um, and then thinking about the question, I mean, I would love to kind of, you know, hear your perspective and just because you're, have, Th thought so many fascinating things about this, but I'd love to, you know, kind of hear how it intersected for you on the question of migration. Um, but I will say that many economic anthropologists had have studied money systems as they relate to remittances and as they relate to kind of like development. Um, and and very few very little attention had been paid to the kinds of meaning and politics of payment systems in the United States. Um, as though the, and this I think is an error that, you know, so we tend to repeat again and again as scholars, but as though um, economic transactions in primitive societies are more meaningful and um, economic transactions in the West are, you know, so much more economic and so much more uncoupled um, from, you know, social uh, aspects. Um, and so I wanted to kind of re-socialize Western money and Northern money and, and, and demonstrate um, the contours of the kind of inequalities inscribed therein. Um, so, so yeah. Um, yeah, yeah no, I want to hear what you, you have to say. <laughs> yeah, no, I can I can chime in as well. But even before we get to that, um, I'm also mindful of the time and yeah. we make sure we have to take questions. So uh, keeping in mind that we wanted this to uh, be oriented towards CMS grad students mm -hmm. and um, other early career scholars and PhD students uh, listening in. One of the other bits of your book that I thought was worth uh, reflecting on a little bit was the sheer range of 
methodological tools you had to pull together mm -hmm. um, because you were crossing across these different theoretical domains. So in one sense, as a good media studies scholar, you really pull together different kinds of artifacts and read them as texts. You do these really close thematic analyses of advertisements, um, like credit card sort of surfaces like these um, that I'm holding up to the screen, uh, but you also sort of trace process. Um, so it's almost like I, I read it as a process geography kind of book where you're going through the life cycle of a certain kind of transaction that gets going and then you're going to follow it through its lifestyle. And along the way, you're going to do deep dives into different moments it ha moments of interaction and which institutions, which actors are then come into play, uh, which networks get activated and so on. Um, so could you say a little bit about that dimension of your project? What were some of the challenges? Did you have to learn new methods mm -hmm. or did you have to retool some methods uh, to bring, uh, as Tarleton said in the chat window, to bring this communication perspective to a very new object that media and Kimcom studies has not tended to take into account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, in some ways, I think this circles back to the question of learning about an object as a community formed around it. So, you know, I came to thinking about money at a time when a lot of people were thinking about money and kind of a lot of people were reimagining the infrastructures of money. I mean, the term fintech basically. Um, came of age during the writing of my book. Um, certainly cryptocurrency and all of that um, emerged during the writing of my dissertation and then book. Um, and so I was, effect I effectively thought of myself as an ethnographer, um, but I was an ethnographer of communities who were rediscovering or rather were discovering their, the genealogy and the history of the thing that they were interested in. So like me, lots and lots of, of entrepreneurs, artists, activists um, said, you know, we need to re, you know, I'm fascinated by money. I'm not sure why, but I'm fascinated by it. And I, and I'm, and I'm desperate to rethink it. Um, and so let me now, now I have to suddenly learn everything about the way the Visa MasterCard network works or like the way the automated clearinghouse works. And so like, like them, I thought, okay, like how do people, how do people in this industry learn about these like really boring systems and the answer to that was they go to industry boot camps like um where you learn you spend one week doing a super deep dive in how um how these kind of legacy systems work and everybody else around me was either employed by a legacy system like a, a big bank Visa, mastercard etc um and they were i was literally doing the employee training that people who work in this industry do or they were learning about them because they wanted to like disrupt and revolutionize them um and then there and i was sort of there learning about the thing but also doing an ethnography of all the people around me um and then um, like many of the people around me, there was the opportunity to kind of discover histories. I, I joke that I am, unfortunately, uh, or for better or for worse, like probably one of the world's experts on the Diners Club card, which was the first uh, third party, uh, universal third party payment card that emerged in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and to kind of and, and so, so Banners Club still exists. Um, it's more popular in some countries than in others, um, but it has gone through a number of different mergers and acquisitions and is now, I think most recently owned by um, Discover. Um, and it was purchased by Discover for its international network. But during many of these kind of transitions, um, its company archive was lost. So another thing that I've learned about um, is that many large companies have their own archive, have their own librarian, have their own archivist. Um, and those can be tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, sources of information for thinking about the kind of um, history of technology and history of business. Um, but Diners Club had been lost. At one point, it had been outsourced to a company that now I think also no longer exists called um, the History Company, no, the History Factory, um, that was meant to be a steward of, of various corporate archives, but um, someone who stopped paying the Diners Club bill at some point, and this kind of went off and, and smoke. So um, I wound up doing kind of, and this is something I've learned a lot about from Kevin Driscoll, who's my partner, but also a media historian, um, which is the kind of eBay archive, the kind of eBay histories where you set up your eBay alerts and you buy everything um, 
<laughs> that, uh, you know, for a couple bucks um, that relates to kind of the early ephemera of the thing you're interested in. So through that, I discovered, for example, um, that early diners club cards had these kind of books and this is actually i have a, a very short piece which i'd be happy to send anybody which is in my edited collection from mit press called paid about the diners club um about the diners club and the way that um the card itself was one innovation but really in order to um, find how to use a diner's club, or find a, a way, to, to, the way to use, the only way to use a diner's club card was to know where it was accepted. And the only way to know where it was accepted was to um, have these kind of guidebooks that told you where, and you could look up like any town anywhere in America um, and know that your card would be accepted there. Um, and so I, and so I kind of began to realize from kind of looking at the books, which I only learned about because I found them on eBay, um, that they were kind of the key innovation and they were the kind of key wayfinding tool um, for the transactional community of, um, of, of the Diners Club card. And so in the short piece that I wrote for MIT, the MIT book, um, I kind of compared it to the green book. So the, you know, the Negro Motorists green book, um, which helped um, you know, African American travelers navigate the um, segregated um, United States um, and find safe harbor while on the road. Um, and I then discovered just by kind of pivoting into kind of more traditional historical um, approaches, you know, just like newspaper archival searches, um, that at, in the um, African American. Uh, press of the mid-century, of which there are many African-American newspapers, there was a lot of talk about how, um, you know, on the road, there was no way to pay for anything um, except through uh, like something like a diner's club card, because, you know, there were no major um, bank networks. There were, uh, uh, you know, you couldn't go to Bank America on any corner and pull money out of an ATM. They hadn't been invented yet. Um, it was pretty hard to uh, get a merchant to accept an out of town check because they, it would be pretty hard to kind of track down, um, uh, you know, it was easy to do check fraud. Um, and so the diners club car basically allowed people to travel and be accepted to kind of book places, you know, pay for hotels, pay for rental cars, et cetera. And in African American press, there was a lot of talk about how African Americans were not really able to take advantage of the innovation of the diners club card because they faced a new kind of de facto um, discrimination when they showed up, um, they had, you know, to pay for their motel room. And the clerk said, oh, diner's club card? Well, if you could just get cash, we'd be happy to give you a room. Um, and so these kind of new layers of privatization on top of the kind of transactional um, technology of money created new opportunities for new and innovative kinds of discrimination and racism. Um, so, and the only way I would have known about that, or the only way I was able to figure that out was by kind of circulating around and around through the kind of pivoting between eBay history to more traditional forms of history. And the only way I really began to think about the Diners Club was from pulling from um, the kind of ethnographic, ethnography of industry contexts. So you have to kind of constantly be pivoting between different kinds of approaches and just sort of, um, I mean, I think back to a piece I actually read in CMS, which was um, the Fisher, Mike, Michael Fisher and George Marcus's like multi-sided ethnography, um, which just encourages you to think about everything ethnographically, whether it's historical work or other kinds of like, um, you know, looking deeply at, at documents and, and follow threads however they need to be um, followed. I also began to think of myself as doing like an ethnography of PDFs um, because so many of the standards um, of these systems, um, whether they're like the Visa MasterCard guidebook or like any number of cryptocurrency white papers are inscribed as PDFs. Um, so like engaging with that, um, that network of, of kind of non-human actors that uh, guide these spaces was also like a really important part of, of my work. I'm glad you referred to Marcus and Fisher and yeah. the mode of historical anthropology uh, and the idea that um, I think I read the same article too, I may have been in William Eurekio's class uh, about multi-sitedness, not mm -hmm. being just endlessly sort of uh, multiplying the number of sites. Uh, but to think of each site in a very, very careful way and how that each site is implicated in a network of other forces and factors, some human, some non-human. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'll 
close by saying that one of the real pleasures of your book um, is you, you manage to intersect with so many different emergent subfields, platform studies, critical infrastructure studies, media industry studies, critical race studies, and so on. And you manage to pull those threads uh, into chapters as and when you need to uh, get into certain crucial conversations that are ongoing, mm -hmm. but at the same time, manage to stay focused on this narrative thread about transaction. And that is mm -hmm. no easy task. Um, so I guess I'll end with um, this question about writing your first book. Right? It's, a, it's such a monumental thing to do. So congratulations again, it's such a great achievement. And to do it so beautifully is, is really no mean task. And so can you t tell us for everybody listening in, especially uh, grad students, uh, early career scholars make struggling their way through that first book. What were some of the challenges? What were some of the pleasures? And if you could even give us like a glimpse into those moments of sheer joy where you realize that's it finally <laughs> all these bloody years now I get it after eight long years um, yeah just tell us a little bit about that process well I'm not sure if I have felt article release just yet that oh I got it done I mean it's I got it done right I got it done but I don't know that I always feel that I got it done right um but I mean I I also just have to say you know when you mention kind of the litany of of um, sub emergent subfields that I draw from. I mean, a big part of that is the network of people who I have had the tremendous, um, you know, good fortune and privilege of you know being exposed to. Some of whom are here today, um, and you know, certainly kind of. Kendall Square between my CMS time and my Microsoft research time um, has been incredibly, uh, you know, important to the kind of formation of, of my intellectual um, life and as it emerged in this book. Um, and I guess that both of that happened kind of before and after the dissertation. Um, but I would say I, you know, in the exciting structure of the book for me or one of the 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 exciting ways of untangling a puzzle was to kind of think about um following through the actual mechanisms of transaction so um getting paid kind of processing those payments paying and then the kind of data that emerges and tessellates out from there um and then actually being able to look and deeply attend and i could i go on for quite some length in the book and could go on in you know chattering about it for even longer um, about the actual material processes that underlie um, the way the the way transactions um, actually function in the kind of like baseline Visa Mastercard payment system um, and breaking the book down into a chapter that that chapters that examine each of those processes um, and really giving myself permission to not spare um, or, you know, to be willing to kind of give the technical detail as much um, of a close read um, as I as I, I felt they needed was really freeing. Um, I often am frustrated, frankly, by um, by scholarship that talks about algorithms or talks about you know technologies as though they were all one thing or as though like you know algorithms what are they we don't know but they're bad um which that's nobody here um but but i think that that tends to be a a problem and so like really really digging into the technologies themselves um and then exploding them out um was something that <laughs> yeah i'm glad you, there's Sorry, I'm monitoring the thing on the side. Um, uh, you know that that was a, allowing myself the time and the space to really unpack the technologies and and treat them at you know as though they were cultural texts and cultural artifacts, which they are, um, was something that uh, I. I was, I'm grateful to be able to have had, and I'm grateful to readers who are willing to uh, spend the time to actually read some of the boring stuff that I find so fascinating. No, no, no not boring at all. If anything, I think it's the richness of that detail um, that then allows the reader to then step back and really um, come to terms with the fact mm -hmm. that it's out of these details that the social life of transaction mm -hmm. really emerges. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's, uh, what's held together throughout 
is what you just said, which is um, where you said, what becomes newly material? That's another mm -hmm. phrase from your book that really stayed with me. And you, and you sort of do the, the attention to the material dimensions of different, mo different processes, like you said, of paying, getting paid, mm -hmm. paying somebody, uh, when mowing somebody something and so on, while not allowing those material dimensions to somehow overdetermine the social. Mm -hmm. So the both of those terrains remain autonomous in your framework, mm -hmm. and you manage to do manage to hang on to both of them without necessarily sort of you know making facile directionality arguments about this leading to the other. You know, it's mm -hmm. in that sense, it is I think an exemplar of doing the kind of conjunctural work that a Stuart Hall might say, like have put everything into context keep the two things together in one frame and see where the story leads you, right? Which allows you to, I think, be really open to new insights mm -hmm. rather than going in and saying, this is what Venmo is doing. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I couldn't recommend this book highly enough. Um, honestly, this is sort of an exemplar of media and transition. All of you on this, uh, go get a copy. Lana will, when, when, when a book tour happens, when a real <laughs> nationwide book tour happens, she will have to come to wherever you are and sign the book for you. Uh, but I had, did have someone on um, Twitter offer to buy a signed copy of the book via Bitcoin. Um, and go. then, yeah, so I'm open to that. But then in the DMs, they were like, oh, actually, can I not give you Bitcoin? Because like, I don't know if you know this, but Bitcoin's pricing is like highly variable. And so why would I pay for a book? I'm like, there you go. I'll talk. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I will but take no. Bitcoin for the book. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there are lots and lots of questions uh, waiting in the chat queue that Andrew can uh, perhaps moderate or Scott, depending on who, who wants mm -hmm. to take that goal. But please, everybody join me in congratulating Lana again on this uh, on this terrific achievement. And yeah, uh, thank you. Let's open yeah. it up for questions. Yeah, and thank you all for um, you know allowing us to do this kind of experimental chat um i i hope it was a little bit you know i know we all have zoom fatigue so i hope something a little bit more interactive was uh more interesting and thank you so much for ask one for asking such um insightful and 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 very kind questions let's yeah let's hear yeah it. let's see what else is there <laughs> so let's start with, in, in keeping with the spirit of this let's start with see whether there are questions from the students first before yeah. uh before i go to the chat list or the qa um is that Thomas? Do you have your? Is that uh, you raising your hand? Yes, go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Thomas. I'm a first year CMS grad student, and so I'm interested in. Well, obviously, you look at me in transition, which is what we most of us do. And I'm interested in how to how do you study the shift between like novelty and continu continuity? Mm -hmm. I feel that sometimes we're like saying everything is new, and at the same time, we're saying like everything is the same always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the a phrase that I had to excise from the book because I used it too many times was, but there is a longer history here. <laughs> um, and, and so I do think that kind of looking at the new and then situating the new or looking at this moment of, of transition, which, um, you know, it, it, that new at any given moment, and then doing this kind of genealogical work to kind of figure out what are the necessary histories that need to be known. Um, and then I have found it really useful. So I think about money, um, one of the analytics that the kind of money, um, uh, money as a object of study has gotten me um, is to think about the way money creates kind of shared futures. So we only use a form of money and accept a form of money because we believe it'll be worth something tomorrow um, or the next day or the next day. Um, and we are, and that is, you know, a kind of performance of the, um, of the acceptance of the authority of whatever um, bodies authorize that value of that money. So, you know, I might feel a lot of anxiety about the death of American democracy, but I'm still willing to accept, um, you know, and use US dollars as payments because I don't feel that much anxiety about it. Um, but nevertheless, I get questions from um, interviewers. I've gotten questions from multiple different journalists this week about people, you know, moving all their money into Bitcoin ahead of the US election. Um, so it, so that kind of analytic, that kind of way that money creates a shared future or a sense of a shared future among those who use it um, became a way for me to kind of think about 
future. Um, so how do the people who use a shared money form understand a shared past? What do they not know about that shared past? Um, what do I need to know about the shared past to understand this like moment of, of, of um, change? And then how does that um, give an object project into a future and what what kinds and like what array of possible futures are made available um, by the object of study and the community that surrounds it. Um, and so your whatever your topic is is going to be very different, but I think whatever your topic is will yield its own um, ways of structuring shared pasts and shared futures and understanding um, these kind of like shared presence. And as long as you are able to endeavor to think analytically about all of that, you'll kind of, I think that's like a, a pretty useful way to kind of deal with that question. Great, thank you. Diego, I see your hand up. Um, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Lana and Asbin for the conversation. Uh, I have a, uh, a question as somebody who is also interested in the kind of like intersection of media and economics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so how does somebody from uh, media studies engage with economists? Because uh, like economics is this really well fenced field, or at least it seems to be this really well fenced field that is uh, really awarded by uh, the practitioners and the scholars in that field. Right? And, and it, at least in my experience, it, it seems to be that they see kind of like media studies as, okay, there, there are these like scholars that they are only looking at the cultural dimensions of the economic practices, right? But, but, but there is more to it, right? And I think that what I get from, 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 the, from the, your conversation is that there is all this like material semiotic uh, dimension of, of the practices of economic, right? And, and that this dimension have like actual consequences in our economy, right? So how, how do we show them that this that this dimension has is important, right? That, that, that's what I keep wondering about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess my answer to that, uh, to use the language of economics is to say, what is the utility of convincing them? Um, and there may indeed be utility, um, but the, but then ultimately like, kind of what is the outcome that you want to have? Like to what extent, you know, I've definitely had the feeling that I really wanted to be more respected by the economists that I've interacted with, but I ultimately don't get anything of that much use to me from being respected by economists. Um, and, um, and then if the question is, okay, economists have tremendous power and they've been able to um, marshal their kind of like weird uh, non-empirical um, way of, of doing theory um, into uh, a kind of like political power, um, you know, maybe that's useful, but then do you have to go through them to get what you need or to do what you need to do? So I think it's like, you know, figure out what you want to get out of it and then you know, go on from there. I will say for me, and this is unique to my case, um, economists, a very small group of economists are some of the only people who are, have historically been interested in payment systems because they're interested in two-sided markets. Um, and so there are like people who want to geek out about payment systems um, who are in the field of economics and they're excited to talk to me because um, I'm one of the only people who shares that interest. Um, so, and, and who is like reading their papers from 20 years ago. Um, so I do think that, I do think that, that, you know, you find common ground that you want to stand on with those disciplines. Um, and then you figure out why you want to interact with them beyond that. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I might be too early in my career to give you more of a um, <laughs> of an answer than that, um, but I think kind of like living in and performing your confidence. I some of you will know what I'm talking about here, but I I know I have met economists in my life literally um, who are. Uh, who I have now turned this like, I, there's a, a particular economist that I know and I turned this mantra where I say, what would, his name is not Aswin, but let's pretend his name is Aswin, where anytime I do anything in life, I say, what would Aswin do? What would Aswin expect? What kind of like privilege would this economist expect to be like dropped at their feet? And then that gives me the power to say, you know, 
like what try, I try to use that to, um, um, empower myself to behave as an economist would. <laughs> so, um, and you know, it doesn't always work, but most of the time it doesn't work, but it's, um, it's important to kind of destabilize the kind of accepted regimes of academic authority. <laughs> uh, Kelly. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I have kind of an analogous question, which is what has been your interaction with the like tech enthusiasts, Silicon Valley dudes who want to remake payments and have, have you had any discussions about your work or do you hope to like change minds? And if so, how? And yeah. yeah, that's an interesting question. So I um, started, as I've mentioned, like in this space when the space was kind of gearing up and um, early on, you know, there weren't that many people interested in um, in this kind of, I mean, there were, but it was a smaller community. And so early on, I was invited to give lots and lots of talks to like fintech groups and Bitcoin groups and that sort of thing. Um, some of which sat at the intersection of academia and activism and some of which didn't. Um, and the that was like a important like ethnographic opportunity for me to kind of try to figure out how to be a critical expert in this space when, when I, in fact, I was quite early on in my work. Um, and it sort of speaks to the question of like empowerment and authority where like they didn't know what they were talking about either. So I could kind of like marshal my own ability to, and, and also really think about what could be interesting for these groups? Like what could I bring to bear? And then an interesting thing happened, which is I wasn't saying anything that was like monetizable um, or that was like um, fed the hype machine. And if anything, I was kind of a hype killjoy um, early on. And they were like, oh no, we don't invite her again. Um, and then a kind of interesting ha thing happened where like we all ride these like waves of hype cycles and suddenly it's like cool to be critical about um, these things again. And so now, fortunately corresponding with my book, but also unfortunately corresponding with a global pandemic, um, I'm now getting lots of new invitations to kind of be the kind of critical voice, which they kind of now decide that they they need to have, um, which is cool. Um, and then the other piece is that like asking the question, like sincerely asking the question, like what do industries and what are you know activists and you know people who want to try to make change from one direction or another? What do they actually need to know? Um, has proven to be a really useful analytic for me. Um, like I found myself studying industries, but the industry isn't very interested in learning about themselves. And so I had to kind of think for whom is learning about this industry interesting? Is it interesting to people? Is it interesting to um, you know, users of payment systems, whether which we all are? Um, and then I had to think like, maybe not really. So like, what is interesting and to whom? And then how do I kind of use that to kind of put it all together to create a book that is kind of interesting to someone? <laughs> um, and so now it's an interesting thing where I think you know, the industries are interested in hearing critique, but they're also interested in hearing about history. Um, and then I, I do hope that the kind of like users at large are interested in, in learning about how these kind of systems actually work and thinking about ways that people who kind of sit at the intersection of user and perhaps like um, change maker, um, can kind of think past the kind of easy stories about like all good, all bad, and kind of dig into some of the um, the, the kind of details. Um, I think one of the most important things to me to kind of communicate to at least the kind of startup community and the kind of crypto community has been to um, really attend to and really think about how much human labor. Um, and of course, you know, you can hear traces of all the interlocutors that are some of who are in this room that I've had over the years, but um, you know, that, that, that new kinds of disintermediation um, of financial transactions via things like blockchain don't suddenly make things happen by magic, um, but rather are it, when they work, if they work, which they usually don't, um, they're the outcome of, of a lot of like human effort and, and to try to get the industry to think about 
how discovering hidden systems and how important they are through the process of remaking them doesn't mean doesn't have to mean resubmerging them as though um, all of the kind of infrastructural care work that went into producing them um, was instead kind of this like the outcome of a um, you know technological magic if that makes sense so so yeah I think like always keeping in mind who um, who would care and like and like what your different audiences are and what you can tell them and and then think about and then also think about like what um the key takeaways would be for the kind of most empowered stakeholders um you know might be for you but yeah having to be like what do i really am i bringing to anybody has been like a really really useful way for me to figure out um, what I could actually bring to anyone. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, so uh, I, unless I see another question from a student, um, for the sake of, since this is recorded, it's sort of my job to sort of read questions out loud just so that they get heard. Um, the chat, by the way, is full of your fans and all sorts of, uh, I'm not surprised, all sorts of sort of, uh, enthusiastic, supporting comments. I actually sort of do you see one genuine question there from Mary Gray, um, which is, do you consider platforms like Venue as re-socializing of money? Yeah, so if we think about Venmo, so Venmo is talked about as, you know, for almost probably most of you know what Venmo is. Um, oftentimes when I talk to international audiences or, you know, um, older, uh, like adult audiences, <laughs> you're adults, but you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I, I have to kind of explain what Venmo is because it's something that's like very widely used among people under 30 in the United States, but not at all used um, beyond that. Um, and it's basically just makes payments into a social feed. So you can, um, you attach annotations to your payment. Um, and then you can also surveil um, the payments that uh, other folks in your network are making or in public are making. Um, so it is often talked about overtly as a payments, I mean, as a social media system, as the, and this attempt to, um, you know, make money into something that is social, sort of make money social. And in fact, I remember having a conversation with a very um, well-known payments consultant um, at a big payments industry, um, trade show and she was like you know people have been trying to make p2p kind of peer to person to person transactions happen for 20 years and who knew all it would take would be to be able to add emojis to it um and i was like yeah but also you're right like who knew that money sort of like wanted to be social um and and that by like like allowing us to kind of surface the sociality of money um, would kind of make it something that would, you know, people actually wanted to, to do and use. At the same time, of course, you know, when we say money is social, um, it can kind of only be social in the kind of Silicon Valley meaning of the term. And so when you, when you hear people in those industry spaces talk about money as social, what they really mean, if they're like saying, oh, we're doing social payments, what we really mean is that they're doing payments whose main, um, you know, uh, monetizable monetizability comes through social media data. Um, so there's this like interesting intersection where, you know, Silicon Valley rediscovers that money is in fact social only through the process of enclosing that sociality um, as something that can be commoditized um, for in one way or another. Um, I am though, I will say, and I just want to give a quick plug to this. I am really excited about Tim Huang's new book about, um, uh, I forgot what it's called, but it's basically about how social data might be the next like big bubble because like there's only so many ways we can do predictive analytics to drive more advertising um and that you know it might be kind of like the big lie that undergirds like all the systems that we like and enjoy um so i i i'll be very curious to see if we ultimately do have uh some kind of crash around that and then you know what happens how do we think about the sociality of money and sociality of other um you know, other platforms that we've invested so much of our lives in, um, if we they suddenly are discovered to be less profitable than we imagine. Yeah. Yeah, and the, um, I mean, to Mary's, Mary's question also sort of prompts the uh, observation that 
the default publicness at the heart of um, platforms like Venmo and many others. And default publicness has been written about quite a bit, right? Um, is that something that becomes uh, the focus for you when it comes to thinking about uh, both the challenges, but also the real risks of that mode of publicness? Um, yes, yeah. And what's at stake when communities that aren't in the Venmo ecosystem uh, don't get uh, or don't become part of the imaginary of Silicon Valley tech growth, right? And mm -hmm. um, so here I'm thinking back to our brief back and forth about migration meets payment systems. And I'm wondering if there's, I don't know this much, but I'm wondering if there's a real opportunity there to do some deep historical work where boundary zones, uh, and I'm looking at uh, Vivek Ball's uh, uh, work here, in the sense that when, when a group of migrants land on the shores of some space, and when there is simply no commensurability between different forms of money that are circulating in that community, both of which happen to be marginalized within the American racial system, what happens then? So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if that sort of deep historical work is also crucial if we are to recognize the very real limits of the imaginations of Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. um, other kind of tech spaces like Accra in Ghana, Bangalore, India, you know, or sort of state-driven initiative. So yeah, not to put you on the spot. Because, but no, I'm well, so in terms, I'll just give a quick shout out to um, an art piece um, called Public by Default by an artist named Hang Du Thi Duke, um, which is referenced in my book, where she looks at kind of the humans of Venmo, um, where, and she uses, she downloads like all Venmo transactions from 2017 using their public API and uses it not to, um, you know, find terrorists or stop fraud or whatever, but instead to kind of paint these portraits of the, of people and the kind of human lives behind the Venmo transactions. And I think that her, and her piece is meant to be cautionary. So it's meant to say, you know, look at all the things I can learn about you through Venmo. Um, and here are all these compelling reasons and it's so easy to just change your settings. So just do it. But at the same time, the piece like really straddles this line where she shows how kind of like poignant and like real um, these like moments of transaction are. And it, it perfectly, for me, oscillates between the, um, you know, the, the very real sociality of payment and money, but also the kinds of um, dangers of, of, of living in this like newly um, public way of kind of publicly doing transactions. Um, and the other piece I'll, uh, I want to mention about that, though, is that for me, in some ways, the advertising piece is, is the main way we think about monetizing the internet, but actually the primary uses of um, payments data, at least for payment apps, winds up being um, operational. So like predictive analytics that like the kind of Eden Alexander story I told, um, uh, prevent against alleged fraud, alleged violations of terms of service and that kind of thing. So they wind up being these kind of like... Um, uh, like they are used, the ultimately transaction data is used to power um, and uh, animate the transaction systems themselves. Um, and so then the problem then becomes these moments when they stop working, they, they break down, you can't access your money, you can't pay with your money. Um, and and so, and, and those, those, you know, ruptures happen because of the um, data produced by the systems themselves. So I think in some ways, like, it's not so much that the data is, or the transactions are viewable or surveyable, but then like how they're used and who makes sense of them. I mean, if you think about Venmo, Venmo is the most public um, of you know, transaction systems. It's the only one that I know of that has like a really solid public API. Um, whereas others like, you know, Facebook and um, Google tend to be more like data hoarders. Um, so like kind of what happens, like what kinds of what kinds of degrees of publicity and privacy are are useful and for what ends. But to your question um, about transnation transnationality, this isn't exact. I do think I absolutely think more work needs to be done along the historical lines you describe. But the thing it reminds me of is um, is two anecdotes that wound up in the book, which is the way that people continue to use money systems that are based in one place, even as they transit to the, to another place. So my students always tell me about how, when, you know, what I teach class called money, media and technology, where we lay all of this out. And again and again, they say, it's so interesting. I've heard this exact same story again and again, that when I was in study abroad or when I went abroad for the summer, 
my friends and I and my friend group had one designated person who handled the money, meaning handled the money of whatever locale they were in. Um, trafficked in euros or pesos or whatever. Um, whereas we all settled up in the background using Venmo. So we were all living in the kind of this micro transactional community and we had one kind of envoy into the um, you know transactional world around us. And so this kind of experience of being this like fumbling um, maladapted user of, a fo of foreign money was was something they didn't really get to experience because they were primarily living within the kind of safe harbor of something they understood, which was Venmo. And all of those Venmo transactions um, were settling up on cloud computers that were assigned to the United States. And therefore they, they may have left the United States, but their money never did. Um, and similarly, there are, you know, with WeChat, if we think about, um, you know, China, um, you know, there is a, a Chinese restaurant across the street from the University of Virginia where WeChat is accepted um, and WeChat Pay is accepted. And, and Chinese students will look at WeChat to see the kind of moments, to see the specials of the day and transact entirely with WeChat in this, um, with this restaurant and amongst themselves. Um, and similarly, WeChat can be used at um, all Caesars own casinos in Vegas. Um, so when I was at these um, money trade shows uh, in Vegas, I saw large groups of Chinese tourists transacting entirely in WeChat, except for with gambling, because you're not allowed to use it to buy gambling chips. Um, that's the one prohibition. Um, fully remaining within the kind of communicative world and transactional world of China, even as they traveled beyond. So I'm really interested in how payment, and this kind of goes back to the Diners Club thing, thinking about like payment as a wayfinding tool, payment as a tool of geography, um, remakes geographies in ways that don't simply map to territoriality. Like what does it mean to be somewhere? Um, and, and what does it mean to be somewhere even as most of your communications, including your financial communications are happening somewhere else, so to speak? Yeah. No, absolutely. There's a history to be told. There's a story to be told about like you said, with the person who handles money for all the study abroad students, mm -hmm. mediating personas, perhaps, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. These are money, uh, money handlers. And I'm thinking about the grocery stores that I relied on and the grocery store owner who could mediate for me, uh, basically remittances for, you know, through the 90s, mm -hmm. uh, which have now disappeared from a certain kind of cultural geography and the geography of urban sort of, you know, cities with WhatsApp, with WeChat and so on. So there's this Interesting, so that, that's what I meant when I said, how do we recover that, those kinds of imaginaries mm -hmm. of relationships across space being sustained by networks of payments that tech bureaus in Silicon Valley A, neither have the interest nor the inclination to grasp mm -hmm. uh, that form of sociality, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I was turning to Vivek and wondering if Bengali Harlem has stories about payment and money uh, as a crucial form of sociality for uh, the kinds of people who landed up in Harlem at the turn of the century. But uh, anyway, sorry. Yeah, well, one thing I will say about Harlem, I just want to say one thing about Harlem at the turn of the century, or rather Harlem in the, well, Manhattan in the postbellum period is yeah. that in the United States, the um, state issued currency was not fully consolidated until well after the Civil War. Um, so if you were entering Manhattan, whether as an immigrant from the hinterlands in the United States or from anywhere, you suddenly had to navigate a very cacophonous monetary ecosystem. And David Hinken, um, who's a, a, um, a historian, has a really great book called City Reading that's about all the different forms of reading the largely illiterate um, population of major cities had to do, and meaning he means New York, um, in the, 18th, in the 19th century and being able to say, okay, this banknote is real. This banknote is fake. This banknote is real, but it's from a bank that went out of business. This banknote is actually issued from a private bank that would be good in Philadelphia, but probably isn't good in, um, in New York and having to kind of and or be like, this one's probably not good, but I guarantee someone else will take it um, was a crucial way of being street smart. And I think 
and this is kind of like a big takeaway that we didn't really talk about from the book is that, you know, people often ask me what the future of money is. And I don't think state issued currencies are going anywhere. Um, I don't think cash necessarily is going anywhere. But I, what I do think where we'll be seeing is a new period of monetary plurality, um, where we will be having to negotiate many, many different forms of money, both in the kind of rails, the systems that power them, but also like these mediated forms that they take, um, but also the kind of tokens of, um, oh, it's my, I need to not look at the chat. Okay. Um, so, so, and so how do we live in a world of plurality? How do we negotiate that plurality? How do we deal with deprecated money forms? Um, I underline, I underline yeah. those sentences. You say their plurality could mean your transactional life is variegated, omnivorous, constantly shifting between different monies, different communities. Um, I think, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, right. And I think learning to live with plurality will be the kind of key political question of our kind of monetary lives in the next, in the coming decades. Yeah. So we have two very thoughtful questions in the Q and A. Um, do you guys have time to stay past six thirty, or do you need to? Let's do. Can we? Um, so I should probably go. Um, for family reasons, but maybe if you can just read the two questions and sure. um, you know, we can say like five more minutes, but if anybody needs to go, please don't, I won't, you know, bye. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I have to disappear at 6.30, but um, the questions, one is from Radu. It's uh, when studying money, I tend to go to the heavy emergence of microtransactions and video games. How can we think of this the same way we regard dollars in society as a way of getting us a product or a good, or are they a commodity in themselves? So that's one, micro -contact. Second question, thanks for a great talk. Sorry for the long question. In exploring money as media, I was wondering about your take on the similarities of oppressive economic sanctions impacting citizens of certain countries, denying them the use of global financial system and the new global social media, excluding and deplatforming certain people and views. This idea of legitimized exclusion on the international scale, targeting millions of citizens, denying them access to the increasingly centralized forms of transaction, whether it's money or knowledge, and of course, for access to knowledge, one needs to engage in financial transactions as well. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, that's a, those are both super interesting, really astute questions. And I think they really speak to like the heart of what I'm trying to um, argue in the book, which is like, um, especially this idea of legitimized exclusion um, and, you know, deplatforming via access to money um, and money, you know, financial systems um, kind of speaks to this idea of like not uh, the not having access to money or to be able to pay and be paid is as good as like not having money at all. Um, and so like really, really developing a political imagination around the rails of money rather than just around the, um, the, the economic distribution of money is really important. And to kind of speak to the, um, Diego's question, you know, that's where we come in. Like, we don't need to be economists. We need to study the things that we study with the tools that we have, because we have um, really important things to say. An economist would never think about um, the way that, um, it, you know, it's not simply the sanctions themselves via you know, economic relationships. It's the way that sa sanctions are enacted via, um, you know, PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, and like banks um, that that do the work of transactional communication via what we call media systems, via what we call technology systems. Um, so, like, look for that. Like, look for how our our um, we have the ability to ask questions that are being um, obfuscated or simply treated as like um, like treated as as the as something lesser than the big picture, but reality, like that's kind of where the, the, the inaction of these policies actually live and what that looks like. Um, so yes, absolutely. I think, and I think that that's really complex and we need to like spend a lot more time thinking more about it. Um, and similarly, I mean, I think we could say, you know, that microtransactions and video games are actually quite similar, you know, like what are the, um, you know, what are the ways that, that new, 
monies are designed as products and the kind of like both the rails of them that transmit them around the information systems that um, allow them to exist and then like what are the kind of political economies of money themselves so if we can use something like microtransactions to inquire after the political economy of a new money form we can develop an apparatus that allows us to apply that to um you know to living with global money plurality as it relates um to you know economic sanctions and the way that they're deployed via particular infrastructures um so yeah um i think oddly enough those are two questions that kind of hung together i guess <laughs> and, <laughs> well I, yeah and you were brilliant in sort of wrapping them up that that uh that well so yeah but i mean i will the final thing i'll say about writing this book is that it's kind of like a first book on a topic and that you have as economics economists would say like a first mover advantage um but there's so much more work to be done um and kind of like opening it up for more conversation is like a huge part of what i hope the work of the book is lots of unanswered questions okay <laughs> thanks so much uh thank you yes Thank you all. Thank you, Aswin. Yeah, thank you yeah. so much. This is so thank much you fun. Both wonderful to have you both back. Yeah, so, yes. it was really fun. Indeed. Hopefully I wish we could... in person sometime soon. <laughs> yeah, and I hope this format was, um, you know, was uh, interesting for you guys. So, all right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.